guys, this is the video for the lecture on section 6.2 of unit three. Uh, we're working with fractions, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to uh, share my screen here. All right, there it is popping up. All right, so in section 6.1, when we introduced this unit, we started talking about some of the basics of fractions and we discussed how um, we could use what we had learned in the previous unit about uh, greatest common factor and least common multiple to simplify fractions as a way of finding equivalent fractions. Um, we also discussed what an equivalent fraction was. If you recall, an equivalent fraction is uh, two fractions that may look different but actually represent the same quantity because fractional notation can be used much like the normal numerical symbols that we learned about way back in the beginning can be used as a number, meaning it represents an actual quantity, or it can be used as a numeral, which represents a relationship. In this case, it rep represents the relationship of parts to a whole, which is why we use the notation that we use. But of course, I'm sure that you knew this was coming. Now that we kind of know how to simplify fractions, we know how to find equivalent fractions using our good old friend, the least common multiple, then we are ready to start talking about some of the calculations that we can do with fractions. And as usual, when you introduce this topic, um, both now to you guys and what you would do in your own classrooms with your elementary school students, we begin by introducing addition and subtraction. The reason for that is because addition and subtraction is the most involved. It requires the most steps and requires the most quote unquote rules to be learned as far as how to work with fractions. Once we move on to multiplication and division, it becomes very, very simple. The rules are a little less stringent and it's a little easier to work with them. So let's spend our time now having a conversation about how we do addition and subtraction of fractions. For most of you, I hope this is a quick review and refresher of things that you already know, have seen and been exposed to, okay? When we talk about addition of fractions, there are two ways to handle that addition. The most common way is when we have fractions that have common denominators. And that is what the theory is representing right here. We're saying the definition of working with fractions with common denominators is if you let one fraction be represented by A over B, and you let the other fraction be represented by C over B, where your numerators are A and C, and your denominators are the same, they're B and B, and I'm gonna make that a little thinner to work with, thank you. Then these two can be any fraction, so long as the denominator B is not equal to zero, because as you know, that's undefined then this is the rule, this will always be true. And that is, please note that we carry denominators into our answer. Denominators are never, never, never added, okay? So if they're common, we just carry it into our answer and we add the numerators. And that is how we come up with our answer, okay? For example, this here's the theory, but here's our example. If we have the fraction 3 sevenths and we want to add it to the fraction 2 sevenths, because our denominator is already in common, we carry the denominator into our answer and we add our numerators. So seven goes right into our answer as our denominator and our numerators, three plus two is five. So here's our answer, 3 sevenths plus 2 sevenths is five sevenths. And you can even see it visually using this diagram. If we have a diagram or, or fraction strip, as you noticed from our, our previous section, we described this type of visual as a fraction strip. And we have a fraction strip that represents two fifths, right? And we want to add to that another fraction strip that represents one fifth. Well, that means we take two fifths right here and we add it to one fifth right here. Their denominators are in common, so we just carry that denominator right into our answer, and we add our numerators, two and one. Two and one is three, so our answer is three over five. This should be really easy, relatively simple. Pardon me, I've got something in my eye here. My apologies. 
And this is the easiest scenario to start with in regards to addition of fractions because common denominators, all we do is carry them into our answer. All we have to do is add our numerators the same way that we've always added whole numbers before. So coming up with our fractional answer to addition of fractions in this scenario is pretty simple. Now, this is where things get a little tripped up usually for students and that's when we have to discuss adding of fractions that do not have common denominators and that is this scenario here addition with unlike denominators okay now addition with unlike denominators is defined again if we let a over b represent any fraction plus c over d represent another fraction and again, both denominators B and D are not equal to zero, so we're not talking about division with undefined, right? Then this is the rule for adding uh, fractions that do not have common denominators. Please note that what this basically means is you must get a multiple of B and D, okay? I.e. the least common multiple. And then you must restate your numerators in terms of that. For this, for B, to get, sorry, to get, for B to get to our multiple denominator, it was multiplied by D. So that means that the numerator A must also be multiplied by D, okay? For D, to get to our common multiple, it was multiplied by B. So that means C, the numerator, must also become multiplied by B. Now you guys already know how to do this. This is the theoretical expression, but basically what it means is this. To add fractions with unlike denominators, you have to first find the least common multiple and then find the equivalent fractions with this new common denominator and then you're ready to do the addition. So in this example here, as you can see here, we're gonna take these two fractions, five ninths plus three fourths. The first thing we're gonna do is gonna find the least common multiple of nine and four, okay? And if we move here, nine and four, we take their prime factorizations and we have three squared and we have two squared. Now remember the rules for least common multiple is you take every unique factor that shows up. So we take the two, we take the three to the highest power it showed up at. In this case, they each showed up to only one power. So we take them to both. This becomes two to the fourth times three squared, which is 36. That is our new common denominator. This is the least common multiple between nine and four. This becomes our new common denominator. Now we have to find the equivalent fractions of that, meaning we have to take our first fraction, five ninths, and write it in terms of this new common denominator, 36. Well, we say to ourselves, nine times what got us to 36? Turns out nine times four got us to 36. So we need to multiply the fraction by four over four. Nine times four gets us to 36 and five times four gets us to 20. And this makes our new equivalent fraction to five ninths, which we put right here, okay? Five ninths was first. You can see that five ninths was first. So now when we rewrite it in equivalent fractions, we put the equivalent fraction of five ninths in the first place again. Then we do repeat the step for the second fraction. The second fraction was three fourths. So we're gonna go ahead and take three fourths and we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna ask ourselves, well, four times what got us to 36, that common denominator that we found? And it turns out it's four times nine. So we take the original fraction, three fourths, and we multiply it by nine over nine. And four times nine is that common denominator that we had already found, 36. And three times nine is that common denominator that we found, 27. So that the equivalent fraction of three fourths is this new fraction 27 over 37, which we go ahead and write down in the place of 3 fourths. So as you can see here, 5 ninths became 20 over 36, and 3 fourths became 27 over 36. Now, what we've basically done by following this two-step procedure of finding 
the least common multiple, and then finding the equivalent fractions of our original fractions in the terms of the least common multiple, is that we've now created the scenario where we're back to scenario number one, where we're adding fractions that have common denominators and the rules still apply. The common denominator gets carried into the answer. The numerators get added 40 times plus 27 and we get our answer, which is 47 over 36. Okay, so hopefully those were steps that you could follow. We're gonna try and do a few more examples like that. Okay, so I'm gonna try and do that example here for you. Um, let's try, what if we were adding two fifths plus three sevenths, okay? So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna find the prime factors, we're gonna find the factorizations of five and seven, but here's where you need an aside and a heads up, and that is, if either one of these is prime, which in this case they both are, the least common multiple is just equal to their product. So if this is A and this is B, the least common multiple will be equal to A times B because they're prime, which means they have no factors they can share in common. The only factor they're gonna have in common is one, which is the factor that all whole numbers have in common. So the only way to come up with a multiple or the least common multiple between them is to basically multiply them together. So therefore, my least common multiple will be 35, right? Which is basically five times seven. Now I'm gonna rewrite my fractions in terms of this least common multiple, which will become the new denominator of the equivalent fractions I'm about to find from my original fractions of two fifths plus three sevenths, okay? So, I'm gonna call, try to color coordinate this to make it a little easier to follow. So I'm gonna take, okay, so two fifths has now have to become a fraction of something over 35, right? So I asked myself, five times what got me to 35? Turns out it was five times seven. So now to get the new numerator of this equivalent fraction, I must do the same. Two times seven is 14. So there is the equivalent fraction to two fifths. It is 14 over 35, okay? Now I'm gonna do the equivalent fraction for three sevenths in terms of this new common denominator. So I'm gonna say to myself, okay, three sevenths, and now has to equal a fraction with the denominator 35, and I asked myself, all right, seven times what got me to 35? Seven times five. So that means I must do the same thing to the numerator. Three times five gives me 15. So that is my new equivalent fraction to three sevenths. So now I'm ready to rewrite my problem, okay, as my first fraction was two fifths, so my first fraction now has to be the equivalent of two fifths, which is 14 over 35, plus my second fraction was three sevenths, so now my second fraction has to be the equivalent of three sevenths, which was 15 over 35. And now because I have common denominators, I follow the rules of adding fractions with common denominators, which says that you take your denominator and you carry it into your answer. And then you add your numerators and 14 plus 15 is 29. So this is the sum of our original fractions two fifths plus three sevenths, which you could rewrite if you wanted to like this. You could say two fifths plus three sevenths equals 29 over 35, okay? So hopefully this second example helped to clear up the process of what you need to do if you start out with two fractions that do not have common denominators. In essence, we cannot add them if they do not have common denominators, so we must turn them into equivalent versions of themselves where they now have a common denominator that we found by using the least common multiple 
And then we can add them because now they will have a common denominator and we can follow the rules of adding fractions with a common denominator. So I hope that, that makes it a little simpler to understand. Now, we want to go ahead and start talking about some of the properties that exist for addition of fractions. And you're going to find that almost all the properties that exist in addition of whole numbers are going to apply for the addition of fractions. With um, the addition of perhaps a property that you haven't discussed before in terms of whole numbers, which is this property here, the closure property, okay, which I'm going to highlight to make it a little easier. So the closure property basically states that the sum of two fractions will be a fraction, okay? That's what closure means. It means that the type of numbers you came, you started with give you an answer that is that same type of number. So for example, the addition of whole numbers also has the closure property because if you take two whole numbers and you add them together, your answer is also a whole number, okay? Now, this closure property does not hold for every type of calculation, so that is why you need to learn it and bear it in mind. But in the um, calculation of the sum of fractions, the closure property does exist because if you take one fraction and you add another fraction to it, the sum or the answer of that calculation will also be a fraction. Bear in mind that even if that sum is a whole number, we can write whole numbers as fractions. So for example, if you did four fifths plus one fifth, which equals five over five, this is the fraction notation for the number one. Okay, so it would still satisfy the closure property because we can take this whole number and it can be written in fraction form. So because it can still be written in fraction form, it does not violate the closure property that states that we started with a fraction, we added another fraction, and our answer is a fraction. And it is because we can state any whole number in terms of a fraction, so that's why um, the closure property is not violated, okay? I'm going to go ahead and erase that example here. And, and you can see it, here's another example you can see here with the fraction strip, strips. We decided to do one fifth, okay? So here is one fifth represented in fraction strip, plus two fifths, here's the two fifths represented in fraction strips, gives us a total of three fifths. And the closure property is proven because we had fraction plus fraction equals fraction, okay? Now, the commutative property also applies to, to uh, addition of fractions, just like it applies to addition. And if you recall, the commutative property basically states that order does not matter. If we start with the fraction A over B plus the fraction C over B, or if we start with the fraction C over B plus the fraction A over B, irregardless, their answers will be the same, okay? As you can see here in this example, all right. If we do one fifth plus two fifths, we get three fifths. If we do two fifths plus one fifth, we still get three fifths. So the order did not matter as far as the answer that we got. And you can see it even better here in um, these diagrams that I have for you, the region diagrams, which is uh, the type of diagram that we talked about in uh, section 6.1. If I do one fourth plus two fourths, my answer is three fourths, right? Or if I do two fourths plus one fourth, my answer is still three fourths. So once again, order does not change the sum. And that is in essence what the commutative property says, okay? That order does not matter in addition because it does not impact the answer, okay? So order does not matter. Okay, let us continue and discuss the associative property. Now the associative property of addition states that if you are adding a group of numbers, you can choose to subgroup them however you wish and it will not change your answer. That in essence is what this is saying right here, okay? This is saying that 
if I'm adding the fractions A over B, C over B, and E over B, I can choose to group the first two together, get that answer, and then add my third, and it will be the same answer as if I choose to group the last two together, get that answer, and add it to my first, okay? or uh, the grouping will not change my answer. And you can see that here in this example, where we started with three fifths, four sevenths, and two fifths. Now, of course, because our denominators are not the same, the first thing we did was find the least common denominator. And you can see here, I found that for you, the least common denominator between five, seven, and um, between five and seven is 35. Why? Because as you saw in the previous example I gave you, five and seven are both prime, so the only common um, multiple they can have is to multiply the two of them together. So the least common multiple between five and seven is 35. So we go ahead and we restate all three fractions in terms of 35. So five times seven is 35, three times seven is 21. So there it's equivalent fraction, okay? 7 times 5 is 35, 4 times 5 is 20, so there is its equivalent fraction. And then 5 times 7 is 35, so 2 times 7 is 14, there is its equivalent fraction. And then we chose to group these two together first, so this gives us, four. if we keep the 35, right, 21 plus 20 is 41, so we have 41 over 35, plus 14 over 35. So this, be, this right here becomes 41 over 35, okay? And we took 41 over 35, added the additional 14 plus 35. 41 plus 14 is 55, carry the denominator, so our answer is 55 over 35, okay? Now over here, um, we did the same thing with the fractions, but we ordered, we grouped them differently. Because again, we're talking about the associative property. The associative property says that we can group uh, the group of numbers that we're adding together in whichever way we wish. So in this case, we group the last two fractions together. So as you can see, the equivalent fractions remain the same, okay? Those have not changed because the numbers are the same. But this time we chose to group these guys together first. So they, 21 plus 14, gives us 34 over 35. And then we added the 21 plus 35. We carry the 35 into our answer, and 21 plus 34 is still 55. So our answer remains unchanged, even though we did different groupings. Here we grouped the first two together, and here we grouped the second two together. And that, in essence, is proving the associative property that says that how you choose to group them does not impact your sum, okay? All right, now, a little aside that I want to discuss here, because we're going to be talking about mixed numbers more in a little bit, um, I believe, in the next section, and you need to be comfortable moving between um, improper fractions and mixed numbers, because you'll notice here that when we added these three fractions together, our answer was 55 over 35. Now, normally, okay, here is our denominator, uh, our denominator, and here is our numerator, right? And I'm going to erase this and write it a little neater for you. Okay, so 55 over 35. Here is our numerator, here's our denominator, right? And normally we are accustomed to where the numerator is smaller than the denominator, but in this case, it is not. In this case, the numerator is larger. We have a numerator that is greater than the denominator. And you might say something's wrong, this isn't a fraction. No, it's still a fraction, and it is a perfectly acceptable fraction. It has a weird name, we call it an improper fraction, which is not really the true name because improper makes it sound like it's wrong, and it's not wrong. It's perfectly acceptable to write a fraction like this. What it does mean, okay, and we call it that, like I just said, because the numerator is larger than the denominator, but what it does mean is it means that there is a mixed number in this fraction. And I always say waiting to happen because you haven't written it out yet, okay? A mixed number is defined as a whole number and a fraction that together represent one quantity, okay? So how do you find this mixed number out of this improper fraction? 
Here are the steps, okay? You take your improper fraction and you read it from top to bottom like a division problem, okay? So if we read it from top to bottom like a division problem, which in the end is what all fractions are, because we're talking about parts out of a whole, right? Which is in essence division. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's get a little water here. Okay? Then you have if you read it from top to bottom, you have 55 divided by 35. And if you go ahead and do long division with this, 55, and you have to do long division to get the mixed number. If you use your calculator, you're going to get a decimal value, um, a, a whole number point a decimal. Unless you know how to turn your, your um, graphing calculator into fraction mode, this is not going to help you in finding the mixed number. So you've got to learn to do it longhand first, okay? So in essence, you take that and you say, okay, 55 divided by 35. 35 goes into 55 one whole time. I subtract and I have a remainder of 30. The fraction portion now comes when you take your remainder and you put it over your divisor. So here it is, 20 over 35. There is my mixed number. Turns out that 55 over 35 is the same thing as saying one and 20 over 35. However, your computer program at any textbook always asks that you write your fractions in simplest form, which means that you now need to look at that fraction part of your mixed number and decide to simplify if needed. And in this case, you do need it because 20 and 35 are not prime numbers. They're composites, which means they have factors in common. You need to find the greatest common factor right? The one that is the largest factor they both have in common. In this case, I went ahead and found it for you. It's five. So then you divide out that greatest common factor as we discussed in the previous sections so that we can simplify 25 over 35. So we divide out the five and 20 divided by five is four and 35 divided by five is seven. So here is the simplified version of that fraction. We go ahead and put it back into the mixed number that we found. So instead of writing it as one and 20 over 35, like we did here, we're gonna go ahead and write it with the new simplified version of the fraction part and write it as one and four sevenths, which is the mixed number version of the fraction that we found, which was 55 over 35. This is a quick little aside. Feel free to go over it again if you need to or ask me about it at Zoom during our live Zoom session. But it should just be a quick review of how to turn a mixed number into a, um, sorry, how to turn an improper fraction into a mixed number. Now back to our regularly scheduled program. We're going to continue talking about properties that apply to the addition of fractions. And again, like I said, you're going to find that all the properties that apply are the ones that apply to addition of whole numbers. And so we have the additive property, okay? Now the additive property sometimes is referred to as the identity property, okay? So you may not have heard it mentioned as the additive property before, but you will have heard about the identity property, which is that, I, that number in addition that when you add it to any number, it doesn't change its value, right? And that's in essence what this definition is telling us. It's saying if we let our fractions be A over B, where of course we're not dividing by zero, then if we add this fraction to it, zero over whatever that denominator is, what we will find is that A over B plus that zero over B is still going to give us A over B. And zero over B plus A over B is also still going to give us A over B. Because in essence, what we're saying is that zero is the identity of addition. And even in fraction form, it still is the identity of addition. So that's why we call it the additive property, meaning that we can add zero to any fraction and it, the fraction will retain its value. As you can see here, we did it with this example first. We did four over five, four fifths plus zero over five. Here is our identity, right? And it does not change anything because denominators get carried into the answer and four, four plus zero is still four. So nothing's changed. And if we switch the order because we're doing addition and we know that addition is commutative, order does not change. If we take zero over five and add it to, um, to four over five, 
this being the identity again, it still doesn't change anything. We still have four over five, okay? So that's basically what the additive property tells you is that it will not change anything because it is the identity, all right? All right, in subtraction, oh, sorry, I got a little mark there for you. Okay, in subtraction, the rules are exactly the same. So you'll notice that we still have two types of subtraction. Okay, we still have two types. We're still doing with denominators. We go ahead and carry our denominator into our answer and we simply work with our numerators. In this case, we subtract them. As you can see in this example, our denominator is the same. So we kept it, we subtracted our numerators and got our answer of three sevenths. And with unlike denominators, it is exactly like it was with addition. We still need to find the common denominator by using the least common multiple to find it. And then we still need to restate it as equivalent fractions by making sure that we also change the numerator. So we follow the same steps, right? Just like we did before, you have to use the LCM, the least common multiple, and find the equivalent fractions of the originals in terms of this new common denominator, just like we did for addition. You can see in this example that we do the same thing. If this is our original problem, we need to find a common, the least common multiple between seven and eight. And like I mentioned before, because seven is prime, you'll notice that the only thing we can do is take the seven and the eight and multiply it together to get the least common multiple of 56. Now that we have 56, we're gonna take four sevenths and we're gonna state it in terms of 56. And it turns out that seven to get to 56 multiplied times eight. So we do the same to top and bottom. So four times eight gives us 32. There is the equivalent fraction for four sevenths. Then we do the same thing for three eighths, okay? Once again, we say, all right, well, how did we get all the way to 56? Well, that meant that we did eight times seven. So we do the same thing to the top three times seven and we get 21 and there's the equivalent fraction for three eighths. And now because four sevenths was first, we take 32 and 56 and we put it first. And because three eighths was second, we take the new equivalent fraction of 21 over 56 and put it second. And now that we've restated the problem, we can now go ahead and do the subtraction. We carry our denominator into our answer. We subtract our numerators, 32 minus 21, which is 11. And we have our answer, 1156. And we could rewrite it, okay, as four sevenths minus three eighths equals 11 over 56, okay? So you see the process is the same and we did talk about it extensively in the addition. So I don't think I have to go over it again more here, but the process is the same. You still have to use the least common multiple to basically get a common denominator, write the equivalent fractions of the originals in terms of that common denominator that you found and then proceed to do the subtraction as if they were common denominators because we really can't do it unless there are, okay? Now, we're gonna talk about some rounding techniques, okay? And this is to help you do some estimations with fractions. Um, the first technique we're gonna use is range estimation. Range estimation basically asks you to look at the whole numbers, okay? So if you have fractions and they are improper fractions, you wanna turn them into mixed numbers first in order to create your range estimation, okay? So your range estimation tells you, look at those whole numbers. And here we have three and six. So if we disregard the fractions, then three and six is nine. So the minimum value of this mixed number plus that mixed number is gonna be nine or nine and something. And then if we take the fractions into account and realize that this isn't really three, this is three and something. So really it might be closer to four, okay? And this is not really just six, but it's really six and something. So it's closer to seven. And we add them together, four and seven, it gives us 11. So the range of our answer for three and three sevenths plus six and two fifths is gonna be somewhere between nine and 11. And we come up with this range by really only thinking about it in terms of the whole number, okay? Now, front end estimation, once again, asks you 
to work with the whole numbers first. But in essence, what we do here is we just split it and we decide to do front, we'll do whole numbers first, and then we'll talk about the fractions and put them together at the end. So our whole numbers are three and six. So we go, okay, with front end adjustment, that means that we should get a whole number about nine. Then we take our fractions. Our fractions are three sevenths and two fifths. So we go ahead and take those because they do not have common denominators. We can't add them in that current state. So we find the least common multiple, which is 35. We find the equivalent fractions for each. So now we have it restated as 15 over 35 plus 14 over 35. And that gives us 19 over 35. So that becomes our new fraction part. And we say that our answer should be somewhere around 9 and 19 35ths. Now, if we did this in actual addition um, of those two whole numbers, we might not land exactly here. That's why this is an estimation technique, but it gets us pretty close and it does help us to really kind of see that we're, the answer that the range estimation gave us is not bad. We said the answer should be somewhere between 9 and 11, and I believe that 19 35ths is somewhere between 9 and 11. Okay, so those are two estimation techniques that we've discussed. The third estimation technique is basically to round to the nearest half or the nearest whole number. So in this problem, I did it in one form. I'm also going to do it in the other for you right next to it so you can see it. But three and three sevenths, we would say, well, three sevenths is about a half because really if this was three and a half over seven, that would be half of seven. So we can round three and three sevenths to approximately three and a half, okay? And here, six and two fifths, if I say, oh, well, two fifths is small. It's not even halfway to, the, to, um, to five. So I'm just gonna get rid of it and round this to the nearest whole number of six. Then this is a much easier addition because I just add the whole number. So it's three plus six is nine. And I bring the half along for the ride. So I'm saying that three and three sevenths plus six and two fifths is going to be about nine and a half. Now, you could have also done it this way. Three and three sevenths plus six and two fifths. Okay, I could have said, all right, well, this one, because three is almost half of seven, I'm going to round that to three and a half plus, and two is kind of almost half of five, right? Two and a half would be half of five. So I'm going to round this to six and a half. Then this would be three plus six is nine and a half plus a half is one. So this is about 10. Okay. And this would be another, and this, by the way, that symbol, it means approximately. So it approximately could be 10. Either of these answers, either this one or this one, would be considered acceptable estimations when you're using this method of rounding to the nearest one half or whole, okay? Last but not least, I wanna leave you with this aside because I did tell you how to take an improper fraction and turn it into a mixed number. I want to show you how you can start at a mixed number and turn it into that improper fraction if you'd rather work in fraction notation instead of working with mixed numbers, okay? So the way it works is you take your fraction, three and one half, you keep your denominator as the denominator of your improper fraction, and then you continue and you say two times three, so this is multiplication, gives me six and six plus one, this is addition, gives me seven and that becomes my new numerator. So that the improper fraction version of three and one half is seven halves. Let's do another one. I'm gonna rewrite it here below so that it's a little clearer. If we start with six and two fifths, okay? First thing we do is we keep the denominator. So we're going to keep five. Then you're going to take five and six and you're going to multiply them together. Five and six gives me 30. Okay. And now you're going to take 30 and two and you're going to add them together. And 30 plus two is 32. And this becomes the improper fraction version of six and two fifths. So I hope you were able to follow that. That's just a quick little study there because you do need to be able to 
be able to move back and forth between improper fractions, turning them into mixed numbers, and mixed numbers, turning them into improper fractions. All right, I'm going to stop my share there. The homework that goes with section 6.2 is already up on your task bar. It is homework number 14. It will be due by 1 p.m. on Friday. And then on Friday, I will see you for the live Zoom session. Section 6.3 will go up on Friday as well. And the homework for that will be due on Monday. Monday, we will be taking the test for unit three um, because uh, there's only these three sections in unit three, section 6.1, 6.2, and 6.3. So on Monday, the test will go live as usual between one and three. If you have an issue with being able to take the test during that time, as usual, please reach out and let me know so we can discuss what our options are to accommodate your um, schedule, scheduling difficulties. Um, and then what we will do is on Wednesday, we will go ahead and start the next unit. But on Friday of next week during our live session, we will still have our discussion of the test you took on Monday. So we'll just have one video lesson and homework assignment for you to work on on Wednesday of next week. But on next Friday's live Zoom, Zoom session, we will spend it discussing the test that you will be taking on Monday as we normally do so that we have a chance to go over it together. All right. Okay. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy.